Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Let's Talk TEFL podcast. I'm Jackie and joining me is Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> All right, Jennifer, let's get into our ESL teaching things. So today we're talking about jigsaw cooperative learning activities, and you might also know them as information gap activities is another name for them. So Jennifer, what are jigsaw activities? Uh, jigsaw activities are, if you think of like a jigsaw puzzle, but it's an activity where each student has a piece of the information and they have to work together to put it all together. So it's actually, it can be like a broad range of things. You can have reading jigsaws or listening jigsaws, problem solving skills. I would do um, something my students would love would be or a half crossword <laughs> where, where each student in a pair gets like half of the clues. So then they have to work together to complete their crossword puzzle. And uh, you can make it a little bit easier by having the each student getting not only half of the clues, but also their crossword halfway completed. So they're um, asking each other, like, what is a cross number one? And the student will give them a clue if they don't if their crossword is blank and they're missing half the clues. But otherwise, they would ask each other, what is a farm animal with five letters? You know, horse, H-O-R-S-E, that kind of thing. Uh, So students used to like doing that because usually um, they like doing crossword puzzles. But there are much more difficult ones that you can do, such as listening activities or reading activities, where you would need to have the students grouped in two different ways. So every table would be numbered, like table one, table two, whatever. And then each student at each table would be like student A, student B. And then all of the A's would meet together and get one part of the information. So a reading passage or a little bit of a listening uh, dialogue or story, whatever you're teaching. And once they have gotten the information they need, and this will take, you want to give them a little bit of extra time compared to what they might need otherwise, because they have to go back to their original table and teach it to the other students. So for example, with a reading passage, they either have to come back and like summarize it Or they, if they have questions they have to answer, they have to be able to uh, answer the questions that are related to the passage or the part of the passage that they had. And how about you, Jackie? What are some things that you have done with jigsaws? Uh, Sure. So one of the classic things that probably many of the teachers listening to this have done already is the unit on um, directions or like prepositions of place. So behind and next to across from where students have the same map, but different things are filled in. And then they have to ask their partner questions in order to find the location of the, the required one. So example, like, where's the bank? It's across from the school or whatever, or it's next to blah, 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 or what's next to the grocery store, um, something like that. So that's definitely a classic one. Um, I'm just trying to think of like other ones. Um, yeah, there are other... Something like- There's other sort of map things that you can do as a jigsaw as well. Like um, one student has maybe uh, they have the map and then another student has like a, a list of directions and the one student gives them the directions and then they have to like see if they get to the place that they're meant to get to. Yeah, there's like so many ex- yeah. activities like this, um, inf- information gap activities, they're called. And I actually wrote a blog article about it. So I'll put the link um, down below. And I think I probably have like at least 20 of these kind of style of activities to do. So just think like anytime a student has to get information from another student in order to complete a task that could loosely be considered, um, yeah, the style of activity. And it's, it's, I like it because it's, okay, so let's talk about the why. So I'm just going to talk about a why right now. I like it so much because it's motivating for the students. It gives them a reason to complete the task. And that's key in any language learning environment. Um, Students need a reason and a why to do something. And if the why is as simple as like, 
I have to fill in my map and I don't know where the things are on the map and I need to talk to my partner. I mean, it seems kind of cheesy, but it's like a lot more interesting and motivating than just like giving students a map with everything filled in and hey, look at this. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <clears throat> are students going to like maybe the best students will, but the weaker or less motivated students in the class will just be like, oh, whatever, and like not care. But um, doing an information gap activity, generally everybody will care about yeah. getting the required information. So yeah, yeah. they have so, to uh, yeah. they have to engage with it more deeply. You know, like mm-hmm. like if you just give them a map and it's got a bunch of things listed, and you like maybe give them a list of you know. So what's number 10 on your map or, you know, mark the bank as number five, whatever, you know, um, that is not as engaging as them having to discuss with one another and, you know, work together and have a common goal. Mm-hmm. And also so another, oh, go ahead. yeah, uh, it also like there's kind of that element of, of not wanting to let your team down. You know, if the, mm-hmm. if the students have to go back and teach the information to other students in the case of like a reading or listening activity, then they don't want to be the one that is preventing their group from being successful. Mm-hmm. Like even if none of them are usually that motivated, it's that whole thing of, I don't want to be the one that, the other people are mad at oh the weak link nobody wants to be the weak yeah. link in a team for sure yeah yeah definitely um yeah I think that's like a huge motivating factor too you don't want to let your partner down even if you don't personally care about the activity yeah. it's like someone else is depending on you um which I think is a nice thing to play into in a language learning environment for sure um yeah, just giving that's another reason for students to complete the activity well or successfully. Yeah, and then another thing I can think of is I like it because or these kinds of activities that focus on, um, I guess, communication or it's kind of a yes. community communicative that's a hard word to say communicative <laughs> task where students like have to convey meaning to their partners who have to understand it. Yes. So it's like students are pushed to actually say something meaningful <laughs> to somebody yes. else instead of just kind of mindlessly just putting words together that maybe don't even make sense because um, their partners would just be like, what? What? I, I don't understand you. <laughs> or like, yeah. So you get like feedback or input in real time about whether what you're saying actually makes sense yeah. to somebody else in terms and, of meaning. So yeah. And that, that forces them to work on like negotiating for meaning, like their circumlocution skills. And, you know, I, I saw this over there and it made sense, but now that I'm having to explain it, I'm not really sure. So you, you might want to build that in a chance for the original student to go back and review if it's something where they're doing part of the activity away from their partner. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so because obviously, like the goal is for them to correctly share the information, you know, um, yeah. and and if it's something like, uh, you know, a map reading activity or, you know, a half crossword, whatever, it, it still requires them to work together to get their meaning across and to receive information as it's meant. Yeah, for sure. And just an activity where you're like, okay, talk to your partner for one minute about whatever. Um, if someone says something that doesn't make any sense, the partner is just going to be like, oh, whatever. <laughs> just like <Yeah>. not <laughs> ask for clarification or not, you know, say like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Like nobody will really do that. They'll just kind of like let it go and just let it pass <laughs> and let it slide. And then what's fine, whatever. It doesn't matter. But in an activity like this, it actually does matter. So um, that's what makes it more, I guess, engaging and a little bit interesting and challenging too for the students who are to say things that don't actually make a lot of sense. It's challenging for them, but it's like necessary feedback, I think, too, um, from other people that like, what, what are you saying? <laughs> I don't understand you <laughs> or your pronunciation is terrible. Like what? I can't understand the words you're saying. Um, yeah, so it can provide feedback on the areas that students need to 
um, improve upon. And obviously that's like the teacher can be monitoring the situations or the groups um, not to interfere in that activity or that process, but to um, see like the bigger picture and maybe provide feedback after the activity or to specific students even after who are struggling for whatever reason. So you, it's, it's, it's a nice way to like see what's happening in your class and um, what you need to focus on in future, future lessons. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely helps you learn who understands what or who has what kind of communication difficulties uh, with the material that you're working on in a way that mm -hmm. uh, some other activities might not. Mm -hmm. All right, Jennifer. So how would you implement this style of activity, especially like the first time that class is doing it? Ooh, the first time, um, the first time I would do something that is pretty low level, sort of like we've talked about before, like when you do a new game or like a new kind of activity, you don't want to have like too many moving parts. You know, you just want to give them a little bit to kind of comprehend at a time. And then the next time you can add a little bit more to it. So if it was the first time, I don't know that I would do something like um, a listening jigsaw activity where they have to go and listen to different parts of things because that tends to be uh, more difficult for students. And so that sort of expert group kind of activities where they go and learn something and then come back and summarize it or teach it to their uh, classmates, their table mates. I would save that for when they have a bit more familiarity. But um, the crosswords always seem to be pretty easy to communicate exactly what they're supposed to do. Um, but certainly I would demonstrate like with one student, I would have one student be like student A and I was student B and we would show the class like what they were meant to do. Um, also like with a, a map activity, same thing, you know, just demonstrate, but the first time you do it, don't maybe reach for the stars, you know, reach for the moon. Yeah, always, always demonstrate. That was my um, number one thing. Choose one student and then you can act as one of the students and just do like the first question or whatever and um, my other tip is don't necessarily hand out the worksheets or whatever you're using until after you've done that demonstration and explanation because if you hand it out students just with their partner oh yours is different oh you have all this information I don't and then they start like filling filling it in without even knowing yeah <laughs> what they need to do or talking it's like and I make a big show of like secret this is secret information don't show your partner. So that's like what I will do during the demonstration and explanation. So don't give out those sheets if at all possible until yeah. after that point in time to avoid disaster. Yeah, <laughs> sure. that's that's general advice for any time there's handouts. You know, mm -hmm. hand out the handouts as late as possible because mm -hmm. there's always going to be students who, um, even if they can't understand the written instructions they're not going to let that hold them back they're just gonna <laughs> exactly you know they're so well, whatever oh my god <laughs> look you have all these things in your map that I don't have let me fill it in and then yeah. it's like done your activity is done even yeah. before it starts so yeah be, be wary of those kinds of things all right so what do you think about um jigsaws or um information gap activities can you use them for all levels and all ages of students um I, I wouldn't say like an absolute beginner, but I've certainly done them with really low level students where like I would have uh, students, for example, each put furniture in a living room. And obviously I'm talking about drawing a picture. I'm not talking about <laughs> arranging furniture. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, um, when we would have a lesson on like rooms in a house and things like that, you know, and they learn that kind of vocabulary. I would give them each, you know, a blank picture of a room and then maybe have some different things on the side that they could either cut out and paste on in different places or they could draw. And then I would have them uh, change seats so they're not sitting next to the person that they had been sitting next to before and hide 
their paper and then they would get a second one and they would have to complete it according to the other person's directions. And what they were trying to do is uh, get the partner to draw a picture that matches the one that they had made at the beginning. Oh, this is that's a, that reminded me of a super fun activity. It's like drawing an alien or a monster or something. Yeah, so yeah. half the students are sitting facing the you know PowerPoint with that picture on it. The other ones have their back to it. And then the ones that are looking at the picture have to describe it. And it's really it's a nice that's a nice actually emergency kind of last minute activity that requires nothing in the way of preparation or materials. Yeah. Or it's good to like review adjectives like big, small, long, short, tall. Um, to describe appearance, that kind of thing, um, yes. or even body parts like seven legs and three eyes and that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah definitely. That's a nice one. Yeah. And that, um, that one where it's just either one student is going off of something that's on the whiteboard or a PowerPoint or whatever, or they make their own and then they describe their own to the other student to draw. That's a really good activity that is fairly low stress and can be done with really young and really low level students. Mm -hmm, for sure, for sure. So I don't know, it's like I sometimes, I well, just like in my teaching, I guess the younger the students and the lower the level, the more teacher centered I go in my classes to some degree. I still try to do it very student centered, but um, it can sometimes be quite hard to avoid. Um, at the very young ages and very, very beginner students, they just need more direction from well, the teacher yeah. in order because they can't just talk to their partner for one minute. They can't even right. talk to their partner. <laughs> so it's like, and compare answers. What's compare answers? Like they can't, they can't do that kind of thing yeah. generally. So, so these kinds of activities, I think for those groups, you have to think very carefully and it might be more hassle than it's worth Indeed. Um, yeah, to do this. Yes. So like, definitely with you really won't... young learners, I would only do it if it was something that involved drawing. Like I would mm. not have really young learners like, oh, go and listen to that dialogue and you're only going to hear oh. the first three sentences. Oh, no. <laughs> that no, would no. end in tears. <laughs> that would definitely no. end in tears. No. Yeah. And like frustration, like it's not worth it. It's just so... Yeah, I think this is more like I would say kind of like upper elementary school and above in terms of yeah. age, like say 10 and above. Younger than 10, a bit of a struggle unless they're like, you know, 100%, almost 100% fluent in English and can totally understand everything you say to them super easily. Um, but yeah, younger and lower level students is going to be a struggle. So just wait, wait a little bit until yeah. they're a little bit older or a little bit better at English and then go hard on the <laughs> jigsaw activities for sure because they're super fun but yeah. not for everybody I think no no not for everybody but, <laughs> but something like like even university students or adults who are like very beginner they can do something like that map activity super easily even if they don't have very high levels of English um, it's totally possible it's just the maturity level to be able to do it without like cheating or <laughs> you right. know like looking yeah. at the partner's paper that kind of thing and it will be calm and not like crazy you won't be like totally regretting it it'll it'll work out it'll, it's fine because students will just do the activity um, as you instruct them to do and it's it, it won't be like a crowd control issue or any of that kind of thing. So yeah, even beginner adults, um, there are jigsaw activities for them. Yeah. And definitely things like the map activity, like that's, that's pretty relevant, you know, because you have to find if you're driving, you know, you have to be able to find directions. And maybe these days, everybody's got a GPS in their phone. So it's slightly less relevant than it would have been 15 years ago. But uh, important uh, language for language learners to have if, you know, mm -hmm. whatever age they are. All right, Jennifer, I think that might be a good place to end. Um, so just a couple of resources, if you want to find out more about this that I'll put, I'll, I'll link down in the show notes. Um, so information gap activities, I wrote an article about that on my mm -hmm. website. And then also, um, I have a book that you might want to check out. Um, 39 task-based language teaching and learning activities. You can get it on Amazon, Apple Books, uh, wherever you like to buy books, basically you can find it. Um, they're not all information gap activities, but a lot of them kind of are like in a similar vein or they kind of lend themselves 
really well. And I do have some information gap activities in there as well. Um, basically, students have to complete a task of some kind working in groups. And um, it's kind of a different style of teaching than like the traditional presentation practice production. But yeah, definitely try out some task based lessons. And I think you'll like it. And I think your students will too. It's just kind of yeah. a nice change of pace from what's yeah. normally in the textbook. Yeah, it tends to be much more motivating, certainly much more motivating than let's fill out this close activity in the workbook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's similar to this, the jigsaw things in terms of like, motivation is is much higher, for sure, um, in both of these task based activities or jigsaw activities. Um, yeah, so try them out. And Jennifer, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on uh, YouTube, Teach, Travel, Learn, or on my blog, teachtravellearn.com. And how about you? Uh, you can check out all um, the podcast information on eslactivity.org slash podcast. And I also have a ton of games and activities and links to like YouTube and my TikTok channel and whatever, all of that stuff on that website. And um, yeah, if you like this podcast, please leave a review and um, tell your friends and it will help other people find it as well. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. I'll talk to you later. Bye, everybody. Right, thanks, Jackie. Bye.